Welcome to Season 2 of the Psych Sessions Network podcast, Teaching Matters, co-hosted by Rob McIntarfer of Lincoln Public Schools and Eric Landrum of Boise State University. These 10 episodes in our second season were recorded from the beginning of May through the beginning of September 2021. And as you will hear, we wander and meander quite a bit. However, there are themes for us that emerge, such as the roles that AP psychology and IB psychology play in U.S. high schools, the continuing challenges of assessment, and how scaling innovative pedagogies makes utilizing those principles all the more difficult. To take a deeper dive into understanding the IB psychology world, we invited Casey Swanson, a Michigan-based educator, to join us as our first guest on Teaching Matters. We broke away from our typical conversations in other ways, too. For one episode, we chatted about Albert Bandura, and Eric shared some stories from his own personal interactions. One episode in season two had to be marked explicit. And if I repeated that word here in the introduction, then I would end up having to mark all of these episodes explicit. We end season two stumbling on what perhaps could become a subtitle for our Teaching Matters series here. See what you think. Teaching Matters. Oh, Rob, but Eric, I am not going to give you any more context than that, my friends. You'll just have to listen. Please enjoy listening to season two of Teaching Matters. Oh, Rob, but Eric. You get something to talk about? <laughs> um, I'm trying a pedagogical thing in the AP research class that I'm teaching that might be, I'd like your reaction to, and it might be useful to somebody who's listening. I don't think it's particularly innovative, but it might cross apply to other classes. Sure. So I don't know if this will go anywhere or not, but the AP research class is mostly them doing one big project. Yeah, you still got all four students. So it's <laughs> dropped. That's good. Right. When one or two students are absent, it's a disaster. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. But since the majority of the class is them doing one big project, I thought it'd be useful to, to have a way for them to keep track of their thinking, like a lab notebook idea. So yeah. when I worked at a, when I was the dishwasher and ran simple experiments at the biochemistry lab at University of Nebraska Lincoln East Campus, we had a physical lab notebook and the professor in charge showed me how to keep write down everything in the old brown cover green paper lab notebook that they always used with carbon paper with uh, yes it had carbon paper in it and so i was trained a little bit in how at least he and his lab kept track of things so it's like that but digital so there's one big google doc that i set up at the very beginning and each student has their own copy of the google doc and then it goes week by weeks, week by week. So I have bookmarks set up on the first page that jump down to each, each week. Okay. And then in each week, there's space being text boxes for six tasks. So when we come up to a task during the class, sometimes I have it pre-planned in a slide. Sometimes it just comes up. I'll say, please jump out to your lab notebook. In task one, please do this. And everybody will stop and do that in task one. Sometimes it's pre-planned, so I'll say uh, there'll be a slide that says in week two, task three, please brainstorm five ideas for your final project, phrase them in the form of a research topic and one possible research question. So I don't pre-populate the exact questions in the lab notebook because some of them are just going to come up and I want the freedom. Plus, I'm not planned out that far. I'm planning week by week, but there's space. Just in time planning. Yes, but there's space for six different things out in this Google Doc. So what they'll have then when I am looking at their work so I can use that information in my planning, I just go into the into their lab notebook. And then when I'm scoring stuff, the stuff that I really need to score for understanding and put in the grade book, I go the same place. And then they'll walk away from this with the lab notebook that they can always refer back to. And then I'm thinking for parent-teacher conferences, and I have no idea how that'll work. I have no idea if any of my four parents will even want to do that. But 
what I would really look forward to would be instead of opening up the grade book, I just show them the lab notebook. So I'm intrigued on multiple mm -hmm. levels. So it, have you found it easy for them? Are they seeing each other's work? They're not yet. When I will have to cross that hurdle when uh, we get to peer feedback and we will be doing that. They'll be giving each other a lot of peer feedback when they're actually writing drafts of their abstract and things like that. That wouldn't be hard in Google Docs. It'll just be something that I have to manage and I have to decide if I always want them to have access to each other or is this just temporary access to each other's. And is it relatively easy to navigate? I'm not a Google Docs. Not only am I not efficient in it, I'm really not a fan. I use it uh, when I'm forced to. Okay. It does have some nice shared editing features across people, yeah. but its formatting features are inferior, it seems, if you have mm. precise formatting like a manuscript for APA format. Yeah. I, I haven't figured out the control like I have in Microsoft Word. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. It's, it's inferior to Word as far as really precise formatting. One other nice thing that we'll do for my students, and I'm not sure it would be that it's college level ready, but I think it'll be okay for my high school students. There is a citations tool built into Google Docs. So you just go over to the tool menu and come down to citations and it's not automatic. You have to fill out a form basically yeah. for every citation you're putting in, but then it, you can choose MLA or APA or Chicago and it will handle in-text and reference page formatting, which is nice. Have you played with Microsoft OneNote? Very much. I've heard of that where, where <laughs> public school systems are either, it seems like the landscape has been carved up by Microsoft and by Google. You're either a Microsoft district or you're a Google It's district. a Microsoft product. It's part of yeah. their suite. And if you buy the basic cheapest suite, you probably yeah. won't get it. Yeah. If you get the Microsoft Pro suite, and I don't know yeah. where the, the cutoff is. And I'm, I'm not a power user in any way, but what you're, what you're creating in your relatively complex Google doc to what it sounds to me yeah, is I think baked into OneNote. And I've watched OneNote users who are power users and it's really impressive. Cool. I think Sue France would be one of those people where you can have tabs and tabs can get broken down into folders. And so. You could have the week one lab notebook, and then each of the four students has their own tab within week one. Cool. And then you, there's probably settings where you could say share or not share or share for a limited time and then have that expire. And, okay. and I, it plus I have, but there's other, I don't know if you're using Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle, but there's probably tools built into those LMS devices yeah, probably. that would that integrate with a grade book. Now with four people, it's not going to be onerous, but right. if you had 40 right. or 400, it'd be a different story. That might be neat. And I was smiling because I can't, I'm not sure I could name a technology tool that Sue France is a non-power user of, but. Well, I think she, I think she dabbles in a lot of yeah. them just to understand them, but the ones that she chooses to, to use, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, if she gets into it and uses it for a, a quarter. Uh, right. Highline, uh, she will become a power user. Yeah. Absolutely. So the larger issue that other people might be interested in is this is my first this first time where I've taught a class where I've tried to put get one spot where students reflect all of their thinking in a more of a portfolio kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And so far, I'm liking it. And I think as a student. For some of my classes, not for all my classes, but I think for some of my classes, I would have really appreciated having all of my thinking reflected in one place in a certain order so I could see the progression of my thinking. So I'm hoping there's some power to that. And I don't know if it's appropriate for all classes, but I like, I'm liking the idea right now. Yeah. You're assuming that, and that students are going to be savvy enough where a, they'll appreciate the power of reflection. And B, they'll be so savvy, they appreciate the power of reflection that it's all in one place. Yeah, true. And C, they'll appreciate that it's all in one place and that they'll actually go back and look at it at some point. Yeah. Yep, it's true. And 
some of that is baked into this class because later on they're going to need to look back at one of the things that I really want to measure later on in this class is how much students thinking about their research topic changed over time based on the literature review and then based on the data that they collect. And I'm asserting that you're changing about, you're thinking about your research topic better change over time. Well, if you, if it doesn't change, there might be something wrong. Yeah. So what week are you in right now? Like week four, week, week five? five, week four. And what did they generate? They gen did they generate some hypotheses or some research ideas? Research topics. We're moving from research topics to research questions. And then some of them will actually have true hypotheses. Some will just stick at research questions. Well, I, yeah, I think you're generating your pool and this is a year long thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So by week 35, week 36, when you yeah. come, you could come back and go, all right, let's look at that week four folder. Exactly. Let's look at those. Now we've done this for a year. Yep. Let's look back at the research questions you generated. And they might go themselves, ha, he, he, te, he. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Do people prefer Coke over Pepsi? How, look at how naive we were. You don't even have to say it. Right. Yeah. You know, that, that's the idea. I'm hoping it's like you said, blatantly obvious to them. Oh my gosh. I really used to think that. And I, I think that's a good meta lesson or just overall lesson about research methods. We, we do the research in order to change our own mind. If we're not changing our own, or one of the reasons we do it, if we're not changing our own mind, that might be a red flag about confirmation bias. Is that going too far? No, no I don't think it's going too far, but I, I look at it differently. I, I look at it as it takes time and practice to acquire a skill mm. and we don't change overnight, it took a year of practice under tutelage and expert instruction to acquire this skill. And now I'm more savvy at thinking about the world I live in. And I think about it differently. My instructor didn't teach me what to think. Something wasn't crammed down my throat or the three words that we would use in Idaho affirm, adopt, or adhere. You didn't tell them what to think, but you taught them a method of thinking. Right. So, And this portfolio might be, if it works, and it won't work for every student, but if it works, it might be documentation of their evolving methods of thinking, increasingly sophisticated, we hope. Well, it is going to work. I mean, they're, they are going to record things because yeah. anyone who's in advanced research methods is pretty much an honor student, whether yeah. they're labeled that or not. It's going to work. It's going to be, I, th I think what you're saying is, are they going to appreciate what they're going through by the time they're done going through it at that time? Right, right. Like, will, will they in April and May go, Oh my God, Dr. McIntyre really designed a cool experience. This was awesome. I can't believe how lucky I was. Or are they going to go, thank God that's over. Yeah. And yeah, that, that remains to be seen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, are they going to be savvy enough to get it or will it take a year or two? And a lot of times learners don't know how good they had it until a year or two or 10 years later. Yeah. That relates to some of our other conversations too about self-regulated learners. Part of being a self-regulated learner is being able to look back and appreciate how far you've come. It's a metacognitive skill. Oh, absolutely. Now, before you go down that road, Rob, you know, yeah. you, you prompted this with your discussion of Google Docs. Yeah. And, and if you don't want to go here, we don't have to, but I thought sure. maybe we might chat a little bit about technology in the classroom or technology yeah, great. teaching. Um, I have become a big fan of poll everywhere and I'm in a, a mini debate, a very polite debate with some of our, um, technologies experts on our campus because we are formally and officially an iClicker campus. Oh, they support hmm. iClicker. Anyone who uses poll everywhere is uh, an outcast is a too strong a word, but it is. Yeah strongly discouraged because it's not supported by our technology folks, by our help desk. And so, but we do it in a certain way where we don't pass the cost through to our students. Like I use it mm -hmm. in my capstone class, we buy a instructor centered license and we give it to students for free. 
Cool. Yeah. And I try to use it every day as an attendance mechanism, as an engagement mechanism. I'm not using it for quizzing per se, where there's right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. Scores are going to go into a great book. I just want to engage them. It's my strategy for, I think, instructors lament. Oh my gosh, students are on their phones. And my comeback to that is, okay, let's get them on their phones. Get out Mm -hmm. your phone. I'm going to ask you some Mm -hmm. questions about the content of this course. Get out your phone. I think that's awesome. And I think Poll Everywhere does the phone poll better than any of the other ones. Because there's a whole bunch of different tools that do the same thing. Yeah, you've used it. Yeah, you've used it at the beginning of your talks. Yeah. I think I might have learned it from you. I learned it from you, Rob. I learned it from you. I think you edited something. What was that in? I got edited by you and I used data that I gathered (laughs) via poll everywhere. I think you wrote a book chapter for something. Yeah. I was editing the book or something. And the protocol, and I, I should do this more often, but the way I gathered the data I think might be powerful for just about any teacher who wants to either use iClicker or poll or pull everywhere or a bunch of different things. Before I did a class demonstration, it was a class demonstration on, I think it was operational definitions, I believe. I wrote a multiple choice question, had students before the demonstration, they'd read, the, they'd read about this in the textbook, but before the demonstration, they answered the multiple choice question. And there was a variety of responses. I think less than half the students got it right because it was a challenging question. And then it was split amongst the other distractors. Then we did the smiling operational def- smiling operations definitions activity. And then right after the activity, I asked exactly the same question and students were unified on the correct answer. And to me, that was evidence that the activity was worth doing. Yeah. I I was either that or I thought maybe it was part of a demo that you would have done on single diagnostic assessment. It could have been that too. Yeah, Yeah, it could have been that too. But the pre-post idea using what you're doing with Poll Everywhere, or I'm sure you could do the same thing with iClicker. It just depends on if you want students on the phone or on a proprietary device. Yeah. And if we had Steve Chu chatting with us, he'd go, gentlemen, that th- these people could just raise their hand. Don't <laughs> need an electronic device. And of course he would be right. Yeah. We all get the- to engage our audiences like Steve Chu with 1 million views on YouTube. We're not all that engaged. It's that super deep voice that you just imitated that I think does it for him. But- when you're the nicest fellow on the planet, you can get away with stuff like Steve does. Exactly. And oh. I, I would not ever contradict Dr. Chu, but one of the, I've seen speakers use the raise hands and then I've seen people use the hold up one finger for this, for A, if your answer is A, two fingers, if your answer is B and they scan the room. And I think all that can be work really well. And it certainly is faster, but sometimes I really like to show, sometimes we really want to show the data. We want to gather the data carefully and we actually want to show the data and there can be power in that too. We want to show the data. We want to keep the data after class. And sometimes we want to ask in a way where people can respond anonymously. Yeah. And sometimes we want to have attendance data after the fact, as opposed to that. And just as an aside, maybe 10 years ago or so, Steve and I decided to do a uh, a mock debate at an an (laughs) EPA symposium Uh, I think Regan was the moderator and we debated whether or not the clickers in the classroom and, um, and I was pro obviously, and he was con and we poked a little bit of gentle fun at one, which is why I'm a little bit okay with mocking his voice, which I can't imitate, (laughs) but I gave him a hard time about being old school and I actually brought him and you'll appreciate this. I brought him a chalkboard with some chalk because I didn't want to overwhelm him with too much technology. And on one of his slides, he had the cons of why you don't want to use clickers. I was using turning point clickers at the time. There wasn't a phone app, but students had to buy a physical device. Yeah. And he had a great part of one slide. He said, one of the cons of using these devices is that there are workers in China, including small <laughs> children who are assembling these with their little fingers. And, yeah. Oh, it was the funniest thing. Yeah. And the audience is going and laugh <laughs> and then people just burst out. Oh, it was hilarious. He got me good. And the, the stoic Steve Chu yep. just was, 
hilarious and delightful and on point with every other thing other than that, you know. That, yeah. That funny thing. Yeah. He could definitely pull that off. So the clickers that your that the some people in the campus want you to use rather than pull everywhere are they actual devices too, or do students use their phone to access that? System? You know, I think it's a blend. I <laughs> I clicker was I think it its first incarnation was a physical separate device, but I think yeah, I'm pretty sure now there's an app, and I okay. think you can. I believe the receivers that are in the room in the rooms that are on our campus are now fixed in such a way that. They're versatile enough that you can have both. Okay. I can't think of, I'm sure people on your campus could tell me, I can't think of an advantage of a proprietary system that has physical clicker capability. The advantages of that over something like a poll everywhere. Well, I think the advantage is that a person would not have to, could have a one cheaper advice that I have to require a web enabled device that they bring every day. Uh, huh. And so if as opposed to a thousand yeah. dollar smartphone or yeah. $800 laptop, you could yeah. go to the bookstore and probably buy a $60 eye clicker that okay. you could haul around easily in a backpack as yeah. opposed to a web enabled device. Now, technically yeah. most of the polls I use, you can use texting. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, although not, that's not all of them. I mean, okay. there are some kind of heat map type things where you can outline, click here to indicate on a graphic, which graphic image you want to select. Okay. I did, I, I used some, I used an image this past week from Jess Hartnett, who was sweet enough to share images about a year ago on her blog. If you want to ask your students, how are they doing? She shared like, where are you on the cat scale? She had a three by three of different, nine different images of cats. Huh? And so in Paul EV, you can create, you can outline the image of the cat and let a student click in the image and they're doing it on their phone. But sure. In a text message that won't work. Yeah, that wouldn't work. Yeah. The That's best clever. one that she shared was the Fauci scale. <laughs> nine pictures of Anthony Fauci from really happy on one end to a face <laughs> plant covering his head, his hands on his forehead mm -hmm. as Yikes. the nine. And they're just awesome. So Jess That's Hart pretty and her uh, not awful and boring examples of statistics. Oh, well, she's that not awful. And oh yeah, that's a fantastic. It is. It, oh my gosh. And we should, yeah. uh, when we release this, this particular episode, I will try to, in the, in the show notes, put a link to her blog. That's great. Yeah. And maybe we'll put a link to Poll Everywhere too, if there are teachers who want to try it. Oh, yeah. it is, it's a neat, simple tool. Yeah. And with a low number of responses and students, you can use it for free. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a threshold where you could certainly play for, and there are educator prices. So yeah. there's one pricing scheme for corporate. There's another one for higher ed. There's another one for K-12. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I since we're a Google district, I tend to stay inside the Google environs. So, uh, so I use a lot of Google Forms in combinations with slides with Docs. Well, I love but, Google Forms. I'm a big fan of Google Forms in the classroom. It's a great way if you have students working in groups. Yeah, to have them report out, you get a nice. They have a goal at the end of their group discussion. They know they're accountable. I get to see their data. I I get something at, at the end of that. To me, that's probably the most useful teaching tool out of the suite. So I use that for a lot of other things that I might use Poll Everywhere for if I yes. was in a different environment. The other one that it's hybrid, and I know Sue's written about this too, but it's a tool that I think if I had a larger class, I would do it a lot. I would use this tool a lot more, which is Pear Deck, which combines a slide presenter tool with a lot of this responsive feedback tools. And it works really slick. I've, I've seen it. Oh, I've seen it. Yeah, it's used super effective. I've seen it demoed. Yeah. What's the other one? Is it There's Perusal? The, oh, I don't know about that one. I, I, I've seen that one demoed lately. It, it looks, or is Pear Deck the one where you get statements and you have to sort them in the columns? There's a lot of different formats. The, the, the concept of Pear Deck is you've got your slides. Pear Deck allows you to insert a question slide right in your deck oh, okay. and then the students can respond on their device to that question slide. And then the next slide that shows up are the results of what they said. Oh, okay. 
So it just basically builds, it's like embedding a bunch of pull everywhere is inside a slide deck. Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid that I'm still old school PowerPoint. I never really did much with Prezi when it came out. Yeah. I mean, it made me too dizzy. Like, yeah, me too. Old man. I never saw the advantage of that. And actually, I think I remember when I was using Poll Everywhere more often, I think you can embed. Do you embed oh, Poll Everywhere? Okay, so that works slick. That 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 is a lot like, I think, Pear Deck. Yeah. Decky. And so, yeah. And so I activate the Poll Everywhere slide from within um, a PowerPoint, let it go active, let my students respond, lock it, close, nice. deactivate it. And then show the results instantaneously. Cool. That's very much what Pear Deck does, but Pear Deck does it in a, a Google Slides environment. Yeah. I've just never been impressed with Google Slides and I've seen too many speakers either on my campus or at conferences have crash and burn issues with Google Slides. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and many of them do well, but, and I've actually, I think I've seen a few people who created in Google Slides and then converted to PDFs. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, sure. Because a PDF is not likely to fail. Right. 